So, another uh, interesting observation. Uh, we found facultative migration in red-tailed hawks banded in Southern California. Two of those birds from the original group, they're still transmitting as in 2015. So uh, we've been watching them carefully since Argentina because it's kind of changed the whole dynamic of our definitions, just ruined everything. Uh, not everything, but just changed our outlook. Uh, so here, here we have two birds. Uh, was originally radioed in 2008. It was banded as a nestling in 2008 uh, and spent its first two winters migrated in this period. And just like we thought at about the age of 46 months, it found a mate in the territory and started breeding. And this female did not migrate for roughly four years in this period and then began migrating again in 2014 and 2015. Now mind you, she has a territory. She's not always successful, but she did produce young. She had a territory that, that you wouldn't think would leave. I would not have predicted that adults, once they found their territory, would then initiate migration later, like four years later, but this bird did. Now, her, her banding site where we transmitted her is the dot on the left here, and her breeding site is on the Mexican border. That's why we call her the Otay Mesa female. And you'll notice that she, uh, her summering locations, not her wintering locations, are pretty similar. The other bird was banded at Naval Weapons Station Seal Beach as a male, and he returns to within two kilometers of his nest site each year when he does migrate. But he was very unusual. He did not migrate his first season. He did the second season, he did migrate the second year, and in three years did not migrate, and this year did not migrate. That female, by the way, the last bird, that bird just arrived back about a month ago at Naval Weapons Station Seal Beach. But look, had her, her natal dispersal distance is 150 kilometers, this bird is two kilometers. That two kilometers is more the rule. And here's some quick conclusions. I'll let you read that. The, good, the question is, what other species might also do this? Here's the, here's the meat and potatoes. Natal dispersal and filipatry of red-tailed hawks banded in Southern California. It's really quite remarkable what they do or what they don't do. Why study natal dispersal and filipatry? Well, there's conservation implications. Uh, we know evolution plays a role. It's very important to gene flow and colonization. Our definitions in this case were a hawk recapture or encounter when less than 46 months of age and greater than 100 kilometers. A resident at that time, we consider a resident to be recaptured or encountered when greater than 46 months of age. At that time, when we did this paper and published it in March, those adults uh, were resident. Well, now we know that some of those adults start migrating again. So it's, it's caused us to re-examine even our natal dispersal information because we threw some of those birds out because they were, they were older and we thought they wouldn't be migrating anymore and that they were natal dispersal points. Well, they're not necessarily. What we know is they could very well have been migrants 15 years later picked up in the middle of the Central Valley. Real quick, natal dispersal is the one-way movement of a juvenile organism or organisms from their place of birth to their attempted breeding location. That was Howard, 1960. Philopatry, the tendency of an organism to stay in or return to its home area. Uh, this is another area where uh, terms are often misused or people invent new terms or they expand them. And in, in the case of philopatry, you really have to based on the species you're dealing with. It, it's not the same to examine natal dispersal in uh, beetles as it is for a vertebrate. It's a different sort of uh, territory issue. Philopatry, in a nutshell, means love of home, love of the breeding, breeding location. We, we chose to use a definition of William Shields from 1982 that less than 10 home ranges in magnitude is a, is a good indicator of an animal that is philopatric. There are other definitions. This is the one we're using. We analyze both recaptures and encounters 
and we look at it two ways, both from the perspective of distance as well as territory diameters, as William Shields suggests to look at it. So the objectives were to examine natal dispersal and prevalence of natal filibatry, and also to look at sex bias dispersal. Using that same old study area, roughly 600 pairs of red-tailed hawks have been, 600 territories is what I should say, have been identified on that 6,000 kilometers per study area. I'm not suggesting they're all breeding at the same time. Some of those were found in 1970. Some of them have been developed, uh, urban development, et cetera. So they don't necessarily exist, all of them, at the same time. So we looked at banding data from two 1957 to 2015 and our own recaptured data from 1970 to 2015. This presents a problem because the bird banding laboratory deals in 10-minute blocks. And our recaptured data is very distinct. We have a banding location. We know the exact GPS, and we know where we recaptured it. The banding laboratory has our, and we have the, re, the banding location, but we don't have a good solid uh, uh, data point for the recovery. So we looked at data a little bit differently. What we learned through the literature, and some of you guys are probably out there that did these studies, is that the uh, territory diameter based on nearest neighbor distance is about two kilometers for a red-tailed hawk. Between 1970 and 2015, we banded 6,600 nestlings. We had 86 recaptures and, uh, and 61 encounters. There are a lot more recaptures to be made out there. It's, uh, when you band hundreds of nestlings annually, it really saturates the population. We just haven't had the time to really sink our teeth into a last ditch effort of maybe 30 days of trying to recapture and build this number up. But we're pretty happy with 86. And it's certain the data are very suggestive. So when we looked at the recaptured data and encountered data, it looks a lot different from your basic migration that we've been looking at. This is your, your classic sort of uh, composite flower with all, with all directions represented, both for encounters and recaptures. Looking at Southern California natal dispersal distance in kilometers for recaptures, look at those numbers. Just, let's just do the combined. 5.4 is the median. Well, remember that, or not remember, but take into account that uh, our oldest female is 28 years old. She probably began breeding at the age of 20, or, or uh, began breeding at the age of four. So she has about 24 years where she could, been, could have been breeding. She probably produced about two young per year. There's a very good chance that her progeny, based on what we know about natal dispersal from this study, are breeding right next to her. And next to her, and next to her, and next to her. And I'll continue with that. So these birds really are very suggestive of extreme philopatry, what William Shields called optimal inbreeding. Shameful, isn't it? <laughs> Love those red tails. So here are natal dispersal distance encounters. This is from the bird banding laboratory. You'll note that even when, when, when looking at the issue that we have with 10 minute blocks, we still come up with a fairly narrow natal dispersal distance when using band encounters and figuring in the issues that 10 minute blocks represent in terms of the uh, area, the, the vagueness of that area. We also looked at central and northern California just a couple of them. We banded about seven, seven or, or two were Brian Woodbridge and uh, Buzz Hull banded one of these. Thank you guys. But basically we came up with very nearly the same looking at band encounters. Looking at territory diameters, we defined, we used a definition of less than territory, 10 territory diameters to suggest they were philopatric. William Shields thinks so too. And we used five territories to suggest strongly philopatric. In any event, we've got a population of birds that aren't dispersing. They aren't doing what they taught us in biology, which is you disperse further from the natal area so that you're not, you have no potential of um, inbreeding. This suggests that cousins, second, third, fourth, and fifth, are, in that there is genuine biological and evolutionary significance to that. Looking at the histogram of these distances, or of recaptures, 
obviously skewed to the left. Looking at the encounters, again, obviously skewed to the left. Looking at a map of actual territories, you see how dense these birds are, how, how close they're nesting. Not every year, but this is the layout of those territories. And those are some early uh, sketches that I made of dispersals of birds from one nest, from a natal nest to their breeding territory. The conclusions are effectively red-tailed hawks in Southern California is a highly philopatric species. Genetic structuring is suggested based on the degree of philopatry. And if I'm not mistaken, there is no other species, no other raptor in North America with, seven, with more than 17 subspecies. So philopatry probably contributes to that speciation process. Philopatry has both the potential of being positive and alternatively negative. If you can imagine the implications for golden eagles in Southern California, our population of golden eagles in Southern California is plummeting. It's more than plummeting, it's down. If you imagine that uh, a population of adult eagles losing um, a, a couple members of the adult population infrequently, a large number of whatever few young are produced frequently being killed, and they're all philopatric, add in a bunch of wind farms, which wasn't exactly what Mother Nature and evolution had in mind when it designed K, K species, you have a net loss, and species wink out. Think Swainson's hawks in the Antelope Valley, follow, very philopatric. Think burrowing owls, philopatric. Philopatry is, is very important from an ecological and evolutionary perspective, but it's a hard one as conservationists for us to confront because once those populations wink out, it's a long, it's a long time before you're gonna get them back because the d dispersers aren't there unless you're a red-shouldered hawk population and you have vagrants looking for that magic Galapagos Island, that magical place called the Hawaiian Islands for those two species of hawks that nest there. Future research, I would suggest rodenticides, and I know Alan would appreciate this. I have every, every reason to think that rodenticides are really hammering Southern California populations, and I know Alan has a lot of evidence for that, Alan and GGRO. Other contaminants, um, and I, I say that for basically all species, but particularly those nesting fairly close to urban environments. West Nile virus and the new emerging diseases, that's a, those are all biggies. Um, the effect of weather and climate change on breeding biology. White-tailed kites uh, are strongly uh, dependent on rain, and El Ninos provide that. The other little thing I didn't mention is that in Southern California, our raptor populations tend to be, they, they fluctuate synchronous, synchronously in terms of the reproductive effort. And including four species, five species, who l either lay larger clutches, or in the case of kites and barn owls, double clutches or even triple clutches. That five egg clutch thing at the end of my uh, dots there. I went at 1979 when I was doing the Swainson's Hawk study. I climbed a whole lot of Joshua trees looking for Swainson's Hawks. I found red tail and great horned owls, but I was looking. And it was amazing. There were several nests there with five egg clutches. Of all the places to find maximum clutches, why would it be the East Mojave? I don't think they were rab I don't think they were Legomorse. So another uh, long-term study. Long-term studies for sires and jackrabbits are just imperative. These need to be on the order of 30 years, not 10. This is a 45-year study, and we're still learning. Acknowledgements, I would particularly like to thank Mike McCurry, Mike Scott, Joe Papp, Karen Cernka, Scott Thomas, Cheryl Thomas, Jeff Kidd, Ed and Judy Henkel, Marjorie Gibson, my committee, Lisette Waits, Jerry Wright, Chuck Peterson, Robert Risebro, some old friends, Dick and Don O'Neill, who provided ample funding when working on Rancho Mission Viejo. Spence Porter of Communication Specialists provided countless uh, dollars to my radio telemetry efforts. 
and people such as Chris Niemela, Pete DeSimone, Carly Moore, Jim Luttrell, Richard Jackson, Charlie Baronic, an expert, a guy that was a Marine, he was a corporal in the Marine Corps in 1970 in the Vietnam War. Jim Bryan, Steve Hawks, Linda Luttrell, Bob Shulman, Trish Smith, Donna Krucke, Rebecca Morales, my wife, my lovely wife, and Danny Bystrack from the Bird Bang Laboratory, and Charles Collins from Cal State Long Beach. Thank you. I didn't notice. Did I go over time? How about that? Okay. Um, questions? Most of them lay eggs between March, between March 5th and about April 5th. Go ahead, Bob. Might be choosing 42 months for, your, for the red pill. For 46 the months. Good question. Let me refine that. What we learned from the, because from the, we really didn't know when red tails first bred, but we had two maybe four, I think it was two, of our radioed birds who were clearly alive who died at 46 months, basically, on their nesting territory. They had mates. They were building nests. And so we used that as the only real indication of the first time red tails might breed. So 46, 46 also allowed us to distinguish between uh, a potential migrant, a long distance bird, and somebody who's already nesting, uh, a, res a, a natal dispersal of short distance, that maybe have already made the migration. Mr. Dietrich. Uh, quick context. In my late 60s, I'm back on Pete's nanny for that, so it's a great well <laughs> um, the, the question is that in the 21st century, is banding still an efficient, feasible tool for study of dispersal? I would say yes, it is. And the reason for that is that transmitters do have an effect on survival. And um, banding, banding, while it might not be as useful in migration, I think we have, we know what, how, where birds migrate, but in terms of looking at survivorship and uh, uh, looking at survivorship, it's, it's imperative to band. Ba basically, you can't get survival value without banding. Your transmitters aren't going to last that long. So there's always room to be banding. And as far as natal dispersal, it's not cost effective to do it. However, I didn't have any money, guys. <laughs> this is largely self-funded. So um, even, if I, even if it had been available to me back in the 70s when I started, I couldn't have afforded them. So and I'm sure a lot of graduate students are still faced with that. So it's kind of a poor man's way of studying natal dispersal. And the reality is that um, you can get large numbers. It takes you a while, but you can get large numbers of birds banded. And the reason I selected red tails and red shoulders and barn owls and horned owls and eagles is that they're large enough that the public finds them. So a 4% recovery rate on red tails for a spring, if I ban 400, a lot of birds. So there's, there's still real value in banding nestlings. I think what we need to do now is focus on other species or, or red tails in other populations. I'd love to see somebody like Clint get somebody banding in Texas uh, and, and other southern states. Did that answer your question, Phil? Thank you. All the way in the back. Well, right, you, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm glad, I'm glad you're asking it. Here's the, here's the way William Shields put it. I, I, um, okay, that was a long question. Um, the question was basically define philopatry and natal dispersal and vagrancy and uh, nomadism. The reality is, and I agree with William Shields from 1982, 
that natal dispersal is a continuum. And that continuum starts with philopatry, which by Ernst Meyer's definition, extreme philopatry is breeding in your same territory, in the identical territory you fledge from. So you have that all the way to vagrancy, which is about as far away from your natal area as you can get, and you're winging it in terms of, literally winging it, in terms of your potential to increase your fitness by breeding at some distant location. Nomadism is a specific variant on dispersal because the population is moving geographically like snowy owls and we think long-eared owls and northern harriers, maybe kites. But uh, I, I see nomadism as a variant on dispersal. It's a, it's a great ecological variant that a group of species have clung on to and done well with, very, very significantly so. Murph. Did you see a pattern, you know, before that 46 month threshold, did you see any, any kind of pattern that was suggestive of what would happen after? The only pattern that I noticed visually was I had more recoveries of young birds, band recoveries, and there were very few older birds that were after, say, four years of age. So the band data, our banding data do reflect that at some level. And it gave me a first hunch that, hey, these guys might not be breeding as early as I thought. I used to think that as soon as they had a red tail, they might breed. Now having said that, I've seen two red tails with juvenile plumage building on nests. But in one of those instances that I, I personally observed, the bird was clearly an imprint that somebody had had. I mean, it just behaviorally, it was and the bird, the bird that a photographer friend of mine shot shows a, a very normal looking red tail delivering sticks to an existing nest, uh, but neither one of them produced. So uh, can, might there be birds breeding earlier? I'm quite confident there are. But the ones that I'm finding so far, 46 months is a good place to start the clock if I'm trying to differentiate, differentiate between a migrant and mi migration and dispersal. Does that help? Well, yes, but I, I was just wondering if you had enough data before that to really just see what kind of dispersal pattern among those, those pre-breeding individuals, if it, if it was similar to what you saw after that 46 month period. Did you have enough encounters during that intervening you know, second, third period? I doubt it would have been that much. I mean, we really had 64 good birds. Um, we certainly could increase that number in the future, as I mentioned, but uh, we had 64 that would lend themselves to a good analysis. I don't, I don't really remember the breakout in terms of how old those 64 were, but there is the potential to look at that, certainly, Murph. Thank you. Dr. Henney. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, the question was that Dr. Henney made observations of white tailed kites breeding in southern Oregon, and that those birds were almost certainly vagrants or dispersers moving into Oregon and that they bred there. And that certainly is, uh, that's not surprising given the habitat changes that were, that were occurring at that time in Oregon in terms of uh, past, at least this is my observation or my summation, due to the pastures and grasslands that opened up when the trees were harvested, pastures were created, and uh, there was more availability to kite for kites to forage in pastures for meadow mice, microtus, etc. But um, I do remember that, and uh, uh, I would suggest that's just a, a normal, a species typical response to available habitat and a range increase as a result, even if temporary. Gary. What is the, some of the new scientific techniques such as the, using feathers for isotopes and genomes? Is that helpful in your work? 
It isn't in mine yet, but I am collaborating with a number of other people far more knowledgeable on that subject. So uh, I can't say too much about it because I'm literally naive. So, however, there's Todd Katzner and other people out here that there's a lot smarter on that subject. But we are looking at that now. And now, well, for instance, I want to learn about optimal inbreeding maybe in the Southern California population. So I take a lot of feathers. We collect feathers and blood all the time now. Uh, so there's lots of room to do that. And I'm certainly going to piggyback with other people that, are, that have that intellect. All the way in the back. You. That's you. I'm just really curious about these adult birds that started migrating again after several years of sitting at home. You too? Do you know if the mates of the birds stayed home and migrated to the house while their color was all gallant? We don't really know. No. But they, what I can tell you is that they came back to the same territory. Of, of some interest, I'll follow up with the Seal Beach male. That was a, I started, I deliberately transmitted that population because I knew they were unique from a food perspective. Naval Weapons Station Seal Beach is basically an estuary with a lot of fill, a lot of its agriculture, and it supports a, an, an artificial population of tens of thousands of bodice pocket gophers and ground squirrels. Well, that year when it elected to migrate, it wasn't a drought, it actually got wet, it flooded all of those fields. And so what was, what did have a preponderance of rodents and cyrids suddenly had very little. And I attribute that migration to that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was an honor and a privilege. <laughs>